Hey, and welcome to the Mountain Cat Guitars podcast, where we discuss all things guitar related. My name is Doug Meyer, owner of Mountain Cat Guitars, and I've been buying and selling guitars professionally for over 25 years. From boutique guitar and amp builders, vintage guitar dealers and experts, guitar repairmen and luthiers, retailers, manufacturers, and of course, guitar players, we talk to the people who buy, sell, play, and of course, obsess over the things we love most, guitars. Yeah, yep. Hi, this is Doug Meyer from Mountain Cat Guitars, and welcome to the Mountain Cat Guitars podcast. We are in the Guitar Shop NYC in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, which is a super awesome place where we are partnering up with our friends out here at Leaving the Boutique Guitars and stuff out here. They have tons of bass gear. They have repair guys. Moschino is here. Cobra. James Carbonetti is here. And Eric from Labella Strings is here. It's a super good place. And today we have Matt Rubendahl as our guest. This is him. And he builds classic guitars out here in Brooklyn and makes ruby knives, which are these amazing um, handmade knives, which we'll discuss as we go along. How are you, Matt? I'm pretty good. How are you? I am doing good. So let's start right at the top. Where are you from? I know you're not from around New York. Uh, no, uh, born in Indiana. Indiana, right? Yep. I knew that. In the Midwest, left in the '80s after high school, just moved. And somehow you wound up in Ithaca. Right? I did. Uh, I was living in Hawaii. Oh, right. On the beach, and uh, so you went to Ithaca. <laughs> it snows every day. <laughs> and, well, yes, and I had a friend who was traveling with me, who was a a little. Shifty and someone owed him money in Ithaca for a drug debt, so we we uh, I never heard this no. stuff. So we uh, we uh, it's going better than I thought already. We camped out in the Honolulu airport uh, for a week, and uh, while he, someone wired us money, and then we flew. That's all I got to Ithaca. <laughs> I love that story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then you settled there. No, yeah, I did. did. You get no. the money in Ithaca? Uh, no, no. Uh, <laughs> you know. There's not, it's not a trustworthy business. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, I just ended up, I ended up staying there because uh, I'd been traveling for a little bit. I just sort of. I mean, I think it's cool. I've spent a lot of time there. No, it's, it is. It's beautiful. There's a lot of uh, the uh, quality of musicians in Ithaca is super high. Yeah, it always uh, was. Yeah, there's a great music school, and uh, I just, and also that's how I started doing guitars because I learned uh, there's a bunch of people who make things. Did you work at Ithaca Guitar Works? I did. You did, right? Yep. Upstairs. That was before Rum- Rumble Seat was there. Rumble Seat was there, yeah, but it was uh, a smaller version. Yeah, there was. He moved a few times. What year were you there? What so when you went to Ithaca? I think I was there probably in '92. Oh, way after I was. Because yeah. right, I went to college in Syracuse, ah. and I used to hang out in Ithaca all the time. I had a girlfriend in Ithaca, and I played in a band in Ithaca. Oh, wow, what band? It would never really did anything. It was a bunch of my friends from high school. No, it's, it's okay. What band? What's the name? Had you that. guys play it like at the nines or something? No, it, it was, you know, it, it was always just kind of jamming, really. Okay. You know, like one of my friends went to Cornell, one friend went to Ithaca, and I had a girlfriend there, so I was always down there anyway, but it never quite turned into much. I but, had no idea. <laughs> but that was like the mid 80s, you know, it was a long right. time ago. You know, yeah, and then it was a long time college ago. and all that, but I used to hang out at the Gulf Did you go to, uh, did you go to, I'm going to ask questions now, did you go to the nines at I all? I did a lot. Uh, did you see Pete Panic? Uh, the blues guy? He I worked there. So. Oh, he was really good. We used to go see like dead bands. It was like group yeah. effort. You know, there was oh, a bunch God. of dead bands back then. You know those guys? There's a lot of bands back then. <laughs> Blind Man's Holiday. Yeah. Oh, yes. The worst. Yeah. <laughs> but I used to like it. It was cool. Yeah, was, so I lived there. Then I worked for uh, Ithaca Guitar Works. And then, so when I met you, you were um, with Chris Trainer. Yes. So. I don't know even know how I, I went to New York because a friend, it was uh, Ray Hall. Do you know Ray? He used the, to, with the recording studio? Sound guy. Right. He, I had known him. I, I met him through you guys. And that I, was the theater place downtown. Yeah, I met him because he was a friend of a friend of mine from Ithaca. Right, he was an engineer. He was, he was an engineer, but I had a friend who knew him, and so that's how I got introduced. Anyway, he called me and said that they're starting some guitar store thing, so do I want to come do that? And, oh, and that's why you moved here? Yeah, be taken advantage of, and I said, sure. <laughs> great. <laughs> and then it was, and was Chris already involved in that? No, he was not. Oh, so you were involved in that first? Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes, so I was oh, involved with that. And then uh, I met, I could, the reason why I met Chris through uh, Chelsea. That's how he got involved. Oh, right. And yeah. that's Chris Trainer, our buddy yeah. who we've worked with forever. And he's in Bush. And 
he worked at Chelsea and he's been in billion bands and all that stuff. But think I'm gonna, I remember meeting you because I remember going to Rivington. Yes. It was you guys were already there. Yeah. And he introduced me to you and you guys you were already doing the Rivington thing. Yeah. You know, and you guys knew the guy who owned the building or something, right? Uh, well, no, the guy who was running it, uh, who started it, I don't know. He, he also rented the studio. Right. The yeah, because Craig used to rehearse in the studio, and then Howie had it at that point. Right, yeah. yeah that was after you. If, well, you, from there, came to work with us at Chelsea. For a little bit, yes. I did that, and then... Uh, and then Not I for very a, long. I had a studio in the Lower East Side where right. I was making things and also doing repair also. Right. And then moved to Brooklyn. Right, because I remember, right, because you guys were working at, at Rivington, I think Chris went and did something, and then you were leaving there, because at one point I think they offered me that job. At? At Rivington. Yeah, no, I had to And I said no, because I was happy at Chelsea. Yeah. And then you came and worked with us at Chelsea for a while. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. That's where I put a, I put a screwdriver through my thumb working there at Chelsea. Was I there for that? No, 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 a really long one. I put it right through my thumb one day. <laughs> yeah, well, was shortly after that, I... I didn't go back. Without, you know, you were before, you were there right after Klostad or during Klostad. Uh, yeah, no, I think we were all working there together. Before Craig, though. We Craig, did shifts. Did you ever work at the same time as yeah. Matt? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> all like months. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to figure out who was like there six when. Six months before he just said, I'm never coming back here again. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck, it's all on you now. <laughs> yeah, it was really abrupt. You're like, I don't work here anymore, bye. Handed in the hammer and yeah. left. Get your fucking hammer, I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah, you would like, there was something with storage and Danny or something that oh, no, upset I helped, you. <laughs> I helped Danny organize his storage. Yeah, that usually oh, most people had it right there, yeah. Well, yeah. He had million dollar guitar cases, and million dollar amps. And, um, I helped, yeah, then after that I had to. <laughs> I remember that. I was like, yeah, Matt's not coming back. <laughs> the concept of storage in New York is people pay so much. By the time you're done paying for your storage, you actually paid more than everything and everything is worth. Times a thousand. But yeah. <laughs> and then you have to work. And then everything gets flooded. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone knows has a storage space in New York City. It gets flooded. Yeah. It was on You're the seventh floor and it got flooded. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, okay, so we worked at Chelsea Guitars and then... Well, now you build classical guitars. Yeah. Somehow you got you were you weren't building classical guitars then. You were sort of doing it, but you weren't. You didn't have no. Yeah, guitars no. I was I doing it in Ithaca, right? And uh, and then I came to New York, and you were I had little shops. Yeah, I was repairing. I had little shop spaces, but it was really difficult to try and do that. Right. You know, they were rinky dinky things in basements here and there. Right. It's very difficult to do that. So then after that, uh, when I moved to Brooklyn, that's when I started doing it in earnest. Right, and that's but you didn't really do repairs as much. You did this. Yeah. Were you still doing repairs? I was still doing repairs. I mean, you know, I'll do anything. Right. Guitar related for money. Yeah, because when I first opened Mountain Cat, I didn't know anybody yet up by me who could do the work that you could do, like the heavy duty neck sets. So we were running out to you, and yeah. where you were on the water, you're not still in that same space, are you? No, I moved from Red Hook to Gowanus to Sunset Park. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, so you're here. Yeah, I'm just down the street. Oh, I didn't realize that. 58th Street, yeah. Your shop is in right here. Yeah, just down there. Oh, I went to, I, I, well, you must have told me this last time. No, it's, I, you know, it's funny. I moved. It just keeps getting farther and farther out. <laughs> it's the story. But you here. moved out here. You lived out here. I live in Flatbush. Right, because yeah. you were one of the first people I knew who moved out there. Oh, right. There. To, yeah, to somewhere besides Back Williamsburg. Back then, yeah. right. Yeah. You were like a pioneer. Yeah. Well, I mean... That and the people who lived there since the 1630s. Uh, other than that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they I might have like been I pioneers. You were myself. like, <laughs> yeah. And then the Indians would have been like 10,000 years ago. Right. Other than you're that, a pioneer. I was the first. <laughs> but I remember you going out there. You bought like, a big building, right? You bought a, a building or an apartment? Uh, apartment. Yeah. So I remember that. And you rehabbed it and all that because you're handy. Yeah. Uh, sort of, yeah. I'm making it sound better than it is. No, it's, <laughs> it's a palace. Yeah. <laughs> No, I remember that. That was a big deal because I didn't know anybody who moved to that area back then. Oh, no, I didn't know anyone. Flatbush back then was a little, you know, it was a little dicey. No, it's nicer, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it's, it's nice, nicer. I mean, the, the, the quality of, you know, the Caribbean neighborhood is still partly intact, so it's pretty cool. That way, right. It's just, you know, a bunch of fancy white people in my building. I hate those people. I know, they're so... <laughs> Um, well, at first, every day we used to get asked if we were lost. When we first moved there. <laughs> I love Someone that. Someone would happened. walk up and say, "You guys, what are you trying to get to?" And yeah. we're like, "We live here." No, we're, and, we're, yeah, and then the building's very old, very Caribbean, super nice, very kind of formal almost. And then it's just totally changed. Everyone died, and then it got filled up with other people, regular people. Yeah, <laughs> that sucks. Yeah, it did. It was a Caribbean area. Yep, Flatbush. Well, Flatbush was this. Uh, 
well, other than the Dutch name when it was started, but it was an uh, immigrant neighborhood, you know, probably Italian, Irish, Jewish in the turn of the century. Right, well, I know people's grandmothers lived in Flatbush. And you know, every like, war movie, the kid is from Flatbush. Right, exactly. The Jewish kid. Exactly. And then, uh, and then in the Lords of Flatbush, remember that movie? The, uh, then Caribbean, it became a Caribbean neighborhood, huge Caribbean neighborhood. Yeah, it's so interesting how that happens. Like an area is something, and then it's Dominican. Yeah. Like you go up to the Bronx and those yeah. other all these areas that were Jewish, Italian, Irish. And I think, I think, I don't, I'm not, I'm guessing it's because of the train and the subway pushing farther out, maybe right. about 1910 or 15. Right. So, but, uh, yeah, no, it just, you know, people move suburbs, other things, right. other people move yeah, people in. move out, other people move in. That's yeah. kind of what the Bronx is now. Yeah. Like, the Bronx is all different. My family's from the Bronx. You know, everyone who... Do they still know. own a house in the Bronx? No. no. That's too bad. No, they moved out when I moved out. Oh. Well, <laughs> that was two. Right. <laughs> so I kind of just went where they went. You didn't have a down payment. I didn't, yeah, I didn't have a lot of, they didn't really ask me where I wanted to live. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, so we went. Sucks. We ended up moving pretty much where I live now, which is weird. You know, because I moved pretty much 10 miles from where my father right. lived. But you moved back to the city at some point. I lived in the city for 20 years. Right. You know. It was like right above the, uh, uh, that bar, Western. The rodeo bar. The rodeo right bar. Right around the corner. Yes. Right, it was my favorite bar in New York. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I always lived within a six, I, Moved to 22nd and 3rd when I moved to the city. Then I moved to 24th and 3rd. Then I bought a place on 28th and 3rd. Right, I remember. So that was my six block journey. <laughs> yeah. And then moved to where I live now. Which is where? Suffern. Suffern, New York. Mm. Which is right on the New York, New Jersey border. So, mm. But it's only like 26 miles there. from New York City. You right. know, like, you know, so it's close. It took us like an hour to get here. You know, like, so it's a cool spot. I love Suffern. You should really come up with to suffer? Suffer. Oh, suffer. <laughs> yeah, everybody loves that. <laughs> so, let's get right into this. Well, so, so you started building these guitars, obviously. I've been building classical guitars, yeah, for 20-some years. And the reason why is uh, I was classical guitar player, pretty serious about it, um, and I didn't, I had a crappy guitar. And so, you know, being the genius that I was, I said, I'll, I'll just make one. I mean, how hard can that be? <laughs> and... Uh, and then I'm still doing it. I still don't own one of my own, but... That was happening. Yeah, I, I quit playing guitar after I started making Yeah, them. I don't see you play much guitar. Yeah, just something about it. Just Maybe it was the guitar players. Too many of them just really <laughs> ruined it for me or something. But you were, were you a classical guitar student? Yep. I actually want, wanted to try out for university. Oh, I know I did. Yeah. Was, and you played just classical or you were rock? Oh, no, I played I love bluegrass, jazz, a lot of stuff like that. But I was self-taught, so, you know, I'm, it's good I didn't go to school because... I wasn't, you know, if you're not kicking ass at 11 on classical guitar, yeah, you're probably, fucked, yeah. yeah, there's, it's, you gotta be great when you're younger. I went to a classical guitar school, like, so I went to Syracuse University, but attached to it was Krauss College of Music, which was a classical yeah. music school. So I took classical guitar, of course, which, yeah. you know, I had no intention of pursuing in any way. I just thought it'd be interesting. Those kids get serious. It's pretty cutthroat. Oh, yeah. I'm like, Jesus Christ. And it's like the same well, It's like, like ballet songs dancers over over. or oh, something. Yeah. You know, like, you know, like, you know, if you're not doing it by four years old, you're fucked. Yeah. You know, like. And most of them, I think, and it must be tough because most of the teachers know, there's a lot of good students and you can, you can, you know, you don't have to be the world's best to play guitar. That's not, you know, the goal of it. But, right. you know, for performing on classical guitar, you know, you have to be good or you have to be, you teach it. Which right. is fine too. Which right. would probably make a shitload more money teaching than you would ever. Right. Unless you want to be a performer. Right. You know. Yeah. And even performers for stuff, I don't think they make. Probably. Not. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's like, you know, no one's throwing panties at classical guitar players on stage. <laughs> <laughs> you sure? Sure. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> you would know better than I would. But <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure that's not happening. That sucks. <laughs> Never? <laughs> You're that happen more time. But. So who primarily plays your guitars? So you're, you know, these professional guitars, I see. Yeah, no, I, uh, so um, the clientele that I have in New York is classical guitar players, and those are anything from students to grad students, professors in that world, uh, performers, uh, uh, people who, you know, just love classical guitar, maybe took it in college or just want to, you know, that's what they like. Uh, jazz players, um, because New York has a pretty good nylon string jazz scene. Right. Um, and Brazilian, I see a lot of Brazilian. Oh, right, that makes sense. Yeah. And so Brazilians, you know, e either for choro music or just straight up jazz or, you know, any of the music, Brazilian music is all on nylon strings. Right. So, and those guys are sort of naturally gifted by genetics for right. guitar playing. It's insane, actually. 
Yeah, Brazilians are naturally good for a lot of stuff. Music, man, it's just they're. Yeah, uh, music, I never have a lot of. They can do all kinds of shit. Guys who and women, men who play, and they're just good, better than me. Yeah. But so I assume you have a line of these. I assume they're student level ones. And nope. I make uh, I make whatever I make. So um, I don't have. I mean, I do make it. I make romantic era instruments, which are much smaller, like French, like uh, you know, 1780s, 1820s, sort of like. Uh, rough copies of like a Lakote or something along right. those lines, um, and I made a few of those. Um, we'll and, put up pictures of those because I'm sure you don't have one. And I do, here, right? you know, the jazz stuff is very similar except with cutaway for the classical, but I make them exactly the same way. Um, and some, and I will put, you know, like I have put handmade little pick guards and stuff with the cutaway stuff, so it's a little bit more accessible for that. But yeah, I just basically make one kind of, you know, there is no like lesser model. And do you make them to order, or you just make guitars? Uh, you know, I make them for commissions. I'm working on commissions now. Uh, I would like to tell you that I have like 20 years of them, but that's a total utter lie. I um, I tell people it's like two year waiting list, so right. it looks better. But um, well, they may see them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> by then, by, the then internet. by the time this comes out, this I'll have two years. Well, better, right? Oh, this will now I, you'll have a two year. Right? <laughs> um, and then so you know, w like I'll make one that's not in commission to take to uh, right. a dealer. So. Like this. Uh, yeah, this one is a shop guitar, uh, so I have one or two of these that sort of I sh bring out to show, or if people want right. to play one, Doesn't if I don't have a new game. one or something, so they can get an idea of exactly what they are. Um, and then I take them to uh, the dealer in New York, and the only place really that does that around here, well there's two, but mainly Savage Guitar. Um, do you know well, that? No. In Long Island? No. So he's like the, uh, in the last few years, he's become one of the biggest dealers of classical guitars on the East Coast. He's Interesting. Yeah, I had no idea. Yep, uh, I think he's the places in the city. Right? He's a retired broker. There were those places. You know, we would get classical. We'd get Ramirez's at Chelsea. We'd yeah. call that place the city. Yeah, there's a uh, uh, very nice yeah, guitar salon. Right. Yeah, and so she does. Beverly is. Uh, she's been doing it. She's in her 80s. She's been right. doing it a long time, um, and she primarily does historical stuff. Oh, is that right? So she, you know, if she's looking for, you know, the 60-year-old Hausers, the Spanish stuff, right. the, you know, the things that she, you know, yeah, We would get those things at Chelsea occasionally, we'd call her because you would know. You well, know, like, classical guitars is one of those things where you can take a crappy one and look at it, and you can take another one, and they look almost identical, right. and one's worth 50000 and one's It's like horns in the same way. Yeah. You know, we would get horns, and you'd be like, is this, it's a Selmer, but is it a Selmer? Thing? And a lot of times you play them, and they're like, these sound exactly the same. Right. Yeah, but. yeah, we got like a big deal Ramirez at Chelsea one time, like, if, you know, like, a really old one? Yeah, I mean, it was it was worth quite a bit of money. Because the, the early ones are the uh, late nineteenth century. They're eighteen. Yeah, I, figured, I remember it was like it was a big 70s. deal. Yeah. When we called her. It was like you know, it was it was it was the real thing. Yeah, you know, like you know, Terry sold it. He was sold it, but like it didn't sound that amazing to me. Like not no. that I'm not tuned into classical guitars, but like I mean, they have a lifespan. You know, like everything. Right. There's a maturity like Mark, curve. Some sound amazing, and some don't. Yeah, and so it just depends. So. You know, they do take on, I've played some very expensive old guitars and they have a, uh, a very cool sound. Right. Super lush, quiet, not quite, you know, the same. Right. But well, kind of like an old Martin or an old Gibson, you know, like, yeah. you know, like, a lot goes on with those. Some are amazing. Yeah. Some are like, meh. You and, know, you know, it's not like the violin family where, you know, you're going to be playing a, a 1520 Italian instrument right. somewhere. Uh, the guitars will not last that long. Is that right? I don't think they would. No, they're just, I think the setup, the flatness of the tops. And, and the big giant hole and it all kinds of false. Yeah, I mean, and the Can't you keep rebuilding it or not really? You can keep rebuilding them, but then they sort of, they just I like entropy. I think, you know, it's, it, things have a natural lifespan and then they just fall apart and they, they suck. Well, so. When was the first, say, guitar made? Like, what do we consider the first? Like, uh, you know, I'm not or? a real good, but you know, like, like Villa Huela's, and then some, you know, I think it was probably, again, I should know this, but I, I don't, but you know, probably the late 1700s, early 1800s. So this 1800s. guitar is from the early 1800s then. Yeah, like the 1820s, 1830s. I mean, Torres is considered the father of modern guitar making because he made a guitar that was relatively the same size as what we're using right. today. And, and six courses, whereas a lot of the earlier things like Phil Wales, they're like double courses. Even though they had six strings, they were double courses. Right. Just tune up like that. But yeah, I think, you can probably say early 19th century is when it really came into its... And are those still around? Like, can you... Yep, I've played a few of them. They're still around. Are they sound good? No, those are the ones that i played that sounded... Yeah, they sound really beautiful, lush, but not very loud. You right. can't perform on them. 
Oh. Just like an early uh, any Stradivarius uh, in its original form you couldn't play today because the neck sets were too low because of string tension. So all, right. well, every Stradivarius has had the neck reset and all this work done to it oh, so just to raise that. So See, I don't know anything about volume. that. You know, we did electric guitars and like acoustic guitars, but not that kind of stuff. Like, you know, all these things are special to like horns, you know, everyone's yeah. like, oh, I got a saxophone. Like, I remember like Danny started getting into buying those old Selmers. Yeah. You know, but that's a whole specialty. Like, you have to spend your whole life doing that. Yes. You know? It's funny, there's still, I had some Japanese buyers who came to me uh, every year uh, up until the site certified tree ruined my business with them. Um, but they were looking for classical guitars. They had a store in Tokyo, a big one, and old horns. Yep. They, well, that's why Danny did it. He always yeah. kind of had a read on that. Like, yeah. And then he started buying all these old horns. Yep. And then they, they would come and they would ask me, and, it was, and they would pay me with cash, and they would hand it to me like this, and it was awesome. And I'm like, thank you. This is weird. Thing. That's fine. Um, <laughs> Well, what happened was I was sending guitars to them, and they were lovely people. Except the after 2017, the CITES treaties with Rosewoods went into so every all Rosewoods were now level two versus level three or whatever, right. whatever. So I had to get a permit to send this out of the country, and it took seven months to do that to the government. Oh shit! Yeah, it was it was miserable. So I got one of those permits because I was importing Brazilian rosewood guitars. Right. It didn't take that long though, like. To import them, you were importing them. Yeah. Oh, it's worse to export. Well, I mean, for me, because I got a single-use one, because I don't want, I don't do it a lot. I mean, right. I'm not doing, you know, a guitar a month like that. So, yeah, no, it was terrible. It was right. I don't know if it was just people were pissed, but uh, it took so long. It took to, so many people trying to get it at the same time. Cause well, it's just all it was was a form, and the woman or man had to do it. Just look at it and be like, okay, and send it back to me. But right. it took seven months of sitting in an office, um, and then there was a lot of things that got screwed up. And then once I got the thing back, it still has to be stamped. And then you have to go to an FD, USDA forest place to get it. And right. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. So I had to make an appointment to go to the airport. Oh, shit. To have some like forest ranger look at it, stamp it, and so Oh, man. Yeah. yeah, mine wasn't quite as bad, but I had, like, because I was importing these guitars from Israel that they offered Brazilian Rosewood as an option. Right. Uh, completely legit. Are these blues electric guitars? Yeah. I think I know the person. They're a BNG guitar. I think I know who. In Tel Aviv. Yeah, I met a person. It's a big company who, now. Who made the, they're a friend of someone. I can't remember. Um, they look that like kind of like bluesy design concept. Yeah, they yeah, kind of yeah, look like uh, you know like uh, Robert Johnson's guitars yeah, yeah. with their bass. They're really nice. Yeah. But they, I think they still offer Brazilian rose huh, bass. I wonder how they can like, get it. They do it really legitimately, but they all get hung up in customs. Huh. And, and they own I should jersey. just lie is what I should do. But, uh, but uh, internet. Oh right, <clears throat> internet. But then um, if you get caught, <laughs> if you get caught, they uh, uh, kill you. Yeah, no, they they you. Disappeared in the middle of the night <laughs> by a bunch of dudes in a pickup force. Yeah, guys. Um, black masks. Yeah, bury you there. But uh, I mean, or you can just say the guitar is a certain wood that it's not. Right. Know? So and a lot of times, so now all these woods. Well, that's oh, so this is a so Brazilian rosewood is you know whatever it is, and yeah. there's Indian rosewood and this other mm -hmm. rosewood. Is there any way, like, say you ship the guitar, is there any way to tell the origin of the rosewood? Well, I mean, like, you can tell by looking at it up close. You could. Uh, yeah, can I can tell Brazilian rosewood from India. Yeah, yeah, I can tell oh. Brazilian. Uh, some Brazilian and Indian sort of mix color-wise and stuff, and it can be a little difficult. Well, I've seen them look different colors. And, I mean, but it's you can easier tell by grain patterns or yeah, could... color and grain. Uh, it's easier if you can take it apart, you know, burn a little piece of it, see how it smells, you know, right. how they smell. But some guy at a border can would never no. be able to and tell. and that's the problem. Trained. And then the problem is, is it so then you have to rely on idiots working. You know, right. The now they can tell if it's Brazilian rosewood. Then the problem is the same thing happens is where someone, a uh, violinist, I heard the story, she was coming into the States to play a concert. They take place, the violin, right? And they wanted to take her bows and destroy them on the spot because they had a little bit of tortoise shell, but they were made 1720. But And she was like, no, 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 these were made 1720. Right. And they, she had to leave the country. She had to get on a flight and go home or they would have destroyed them. Oh because they're God. too stupid. You know, so the rules, not everyone understands how that works. So. We hear about that thing where people get their guitars seized. Right. Well, if it's before 1992, you're fine. Because in 1992, Brazilian uh, rosewood became, you had to have a, you have to show proof of where you got it. So if you have rosewood stocks, and this is the shitty part, I think if you have rosewood stocks now, and you build a brand new guitar, you might not have the receipt from 92 when right. you bought it, and you're screwed. So you can't ship it out of the country. You can only use it to a person who lives here. And then what are they going to do? They can't take it anywhere else. And it's sort of... You know, I just had someone offer me wood to sell, or wood to buy. Um, I mean, you might know him. 
you don't know, have to put his name in. CJ Thompson? No, CJ maybe lived in Florida. Repair guy was also in Tennessee. CJ. Anyway, but he didn't have a receipt for it. And I'm like, you know, and he wanted, I think he wanted a lot of money. I'm like, there's absolutely no way. Right, you can't do anything with it. What am I going to do? Yeah, I can't. Is it Brazilian Rose? Yeah, but I mean, I can't resell it. If, you know, they'd never come to my shop to check, but if they ever did, I have no way to prove that I bought it. Right. Except, you know. But what if you bought a bunch of Brazilian Rosewood in 1984 from some guy down the block from you? I think it's a, I think it's difficult. Then you have no way to prove it if you don't have the receipt. Right. So I don't know. There must be some kind of mechanism. They're very serious about it. They're very serious. Yeah. If you That's ship, uh, the guy was telling me if you ship a piece of the Met ship's furniture, they have to get a permit because there's a lot of like old, endangered. Say it's a. Right. But it's a big problem. I don't. And then they have to get a permit to get it back. I don't sell that much to Europe anymore. I think because of all this stuff. Nobody does. They don't want to deal with it. No one wants to buy them here. For, you know because they the. They know you're going to be a problem. There's going to be a huge problem. I deal with can't. builders who ship me stuff. I don't have a big problem with that because right. they fill out the paperwork. Right, they fill out the paperwork. They have to deal with the CITES thing. Yeah. I don't deal with it, but it's a big pain in the ass because I deal with you know, fell in England, a bunch of Canadian people. Yeah. I still have. I don't sell B and G guitars anymore, but I have another company, Tone Revival, that's in Tel Aviv. But that's not Brazilian Rosewood. So, right. so I start to use like the next guitars I'm making. I'm making them out of maples. I make them out of zircote. I make them out of something that is not, you know. So that basically, I, I don't know, does, the, does, the, does this mean that it'll just drive unendangered woods to be endangered? Probably. Right. Yeah. Well, were you building these guitars out of Brazilian Rosewood? No, I never used it. So it doesn't matter anyway? No, well... Well, the boards. Maybe. Well, the, the Indian Rosewood is also certified. So you is that, oh, that's right. All, all Rosewoods. All Rosewoods. Every single one. Oh, there lies the big So that, that's why Gibson is probably you know, going out of business in some sense, because then, A, they got in trouble for uh, importing Madagascar and... Ebony or something, right? But that was sounding like bullshit anyway. Right? Yeah, but there was probably the CITES certification thing right. trying to go around, and then they have to get, you know, I'm sure that the hassle to sell it to overseas now has gotten even right. worse. So, so let's look at this one while it's here. Sure. Because this looks like rosewood, no? Yep, it is. I can explain. So, uh, I make a fairly traditional shaped instrument. Um, you know, a lot of you know classical guitar builders uh, or buyers want. You know, they want you to drink the Kool-Aid. Everyone wants, seems to want like some traditional, a lot of people right. like, this was made just like they made them in 1810. Right, you know? I can see that. It's like vintage guitars. Except in, stuff like they made in the 50s. Except in 1810, stupid, right? if those guys had epoxy and super glue, they would have used it everywhere, you know? Right. What did they have, horse stuff? Yeah, I mean, it's just they want you to use the same materials, but I guarantee if they had like spray finishes in 1810 in Spain, they would spray everything. Well, yeah. yeah. Wow, this thing sounds incredible. But yeah, so I make, uh, you know, this is a, a few years older, but, uh, you know, elevated necks. I use, uh, the construction is a little bit different. I use double sides. This has a double back, actually. The top is very traditional. It's just very simple fan bracing. Double um, back means what? There's another back under this? Yeah, so I, I uh, use two sets. So double sides is a pretty, is a thing they use in a, a classical guitar. So well, you can see it in this yeah. one. This has a, and all, this all has a sound quality, too. Yep. All you're trying to do is just make sure that the top moves and the sides don't. So, so it goes yeah, so you just want projection, and, and nylon strings don't have a lot of chutzpah, so in order to do that, you have to make everything solid on the top of the line. This is really doing that, though. It will project a lot, and it's cool, these, these whole... I can, yeah, you can, you can feel it. Yeah, it's actually a great, I don't know why more people don't do it, I love it. I think you see it now, like we went to the Woodstock Guitar Show, and you see a lot of those things on the sides yeah. there. Like, you can open them, you can close them, whatever kind of thing. Um, it just it just lets you hear it, so you don't, you know, especially something like a classical. Yeah, it's that, kind of interesting because you play guitar, but it goes there. It's you, projecting, but that lets you hear it. You can actually hear it. Yeah. I, I say it's sort of like a, having two radios on to the same station in, in your house, and there's a little delay, kind of stereo delay, you can hear it. Also, just when people play the guitar, they can hear how it sounds, so they're more likely to buy it. Now is it cedar for flamenco guitars or that's nope. not the same? Well, cedar and spruce, same, uh, cedar is just moody, you know, it's just uh, a little darker sounding. And this is cedar? And cedar, and, so it's, and the spruces are a little bit, have a little bit higher end, so they're a little bit more sparkling on the top. This one's pretty sparkling. Yeah, no, this one does sound... I mean, I've never really... I'm also using probably, I'm using, uh, the bracing is probably like German spruce, so I'm not using the same kind of bracing as the, the top is. But I don't really... Play these kind of guitars that often, but this thing is incredible. 
Yeah, they're meant to protect, you know, and in the hands uh, of someone, someone really play, that's right. how you use a guitar, but in the hands of like a classical, <laughs> right. a real classical player, you, they're really, yeah. they could take something and make it sound like a fucking hand. Right, yeah. you know, they can really do that yeah. thing, right? Some people who play stuff, you know, come in and it's just like, you're like, you're like I'm never playing guitar. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I never played guitar. Isn't the thing like the low E string with classical guitars? Yeah, I mean, it depends what you want out of it. The, you know, uh, the cedar's a little growly, you know what I mean? It's got a growl to it. Uh, and a lot of Spanish guitars also have a little bit of that growl. But you know, it's tough because the guitar itself, nylon strings have very low tension. Have to make them loud uh, with low tension, and so it, you know it's a balancing act. This thing is loud. Yeah, it can, it can you know, done right. It can get done. So I cut a little bit of the fretboard off so the nut sits further up, about a millimeter, and then the E slot is back. The G is front forward. This E slot's of three quarters of a millimeter back. Oh wow! So um, everything. So that's it. And then all those are all different. So it just puts the string. It looks like those early. What were those things called that the guy in Grand Funk played? Uh, micro frets. Oh, like mini. Yeah, like between? everything. Everything was compensated like this. Right. Oh no, they do. They have those. I as that's people find make those uh, microtonal fret jobs. Right. Yes. yes. I just say take the frets out and then you can play whatever microphone. But this is all you want. right. But this is all compensated properly, so it always because you know the too. problem with classicals and I've always you buy a thirty thousand dollar you know old Spanish guitar and the compensation it's, it's, it's out, right? And so it doesn't matter. You know one of the things about guitar making that at least I want to do is the thing has got to it's got to look good. I, mean, I think a lot of people put too much focus on how the thing looks these days, right. which because there's so many people doing it. But the thing has got to it's got to work. It's got to like perform. It's got to last a long time, and it has to do the job it's supposed to right. do. Or it's not worth. And the raised fretboard thing is, I assume. Well, it's for two reasons. Because um, a, it's a little bit easier. Uh, the joint between the cedar, spruce, and mahogany is less detrimental than straight ebony, which right. is the two most disparate woods as far as like contraction and expansion. Two, uh, classical guitars have a negative neck angle which is a lot of repair people F up if they don't use to them because the neck angle is going down rather than up where everything else is pointing up. So an old Martin, if you look along the edge, the top of the fretboard should hit the top of the bridge, right? right? So, and that way the compensation for how right, this is not. saddle. And so this is negative neck angle because the parabola string of these, when these, when these go, they, you know, they do a parabola, uh, sort of like a round thing and they, they, they travel quite a lot. So you need a lot right, of yeah. room down here so that they don't yeah, hit they the board. Well, so they don't hit the board. So if this right. is a flat neck angle, like flamencos are flat neck angles, hence why they gr buzz so much, because they uh, want them to buzz, and also because they're like long hairs who want to play really fast and impress people. And, but that's why the, the neck angle on those is flat. And that's why if you play, they're kind of buzzy, you know, right. because of that. But this is super clean when you play. Yeah, and it just also, I mean, you could make these things fart out at any given time, but it just gives you a little bit more advantage. And so new guitars that I build, this whole mechanism pops out. It's not glued in at all. Um, it's just held in by tension by a little cantilever here. And there's a set screw here and a set screw here. And these are also flat. So that you can just up the set screw and it'll actually tilt the neck instead of that. And the action can change because the neck angle changes. So oh, you can lower the neck angle. So you can have a, the bridge is permanent and never moves. You just lower and raise the neck. Itself. That's interesting. Does that change the sound at all? You know, no, it does not. I actually think it's. I actually think it's a little bit better. <laughs> right, it's one of those things where people will be like, "Oh, you can't do that." Like I've had guitar sound. makers tell me, "Don't do that because you'll, if you don't have a connection, the contact." Someone. Right. And I'm like, "How do you know?" I mean, right. how do you know? I mean, you got to do it. But I think right. actually it's better. Right. Better. That's the thing. Like everyone thinks, like, "Oh, a two-piece telly body can't sound good. You got to get a one-piece telly body." Right. But the real tellys weren't two one-piece telly bodies. No. They were two-piece, three-piece, four-piece. They were all kinds. Yeah, of a lot of t a lot of people will use different kinds of spruce for the tops. Uh, that's not book matched also. Right. So depending on, this has got to be the right. Oh, yeah, a lot of those misconceptions, I'm sure you get tons of them. 
Because you get an electric guitar, and electric guitars aren't nearly as complicated as something like this. No, and also people, when they see something, and if it's not quite normal, they want to know why it's right. worth something. Because they see a guitar that's worth a lot of money, like, I want that same thing. Right. But that's not necessarily well, the Well, the same thing. Do. People call up and they would want, you know, I'll, you know, I would carry, like, a, a tele builder, and they'd be like, oh, I want a one-piece body like the 50s guitars. And would be like, but the 50s guitars weren't one-piece bodies. Yeah. You know, I, we offered one-piece body, but the 50s guitars weren't like that. Right. And they're like, oh, you well, know, like, then they're confused. And then you ask someone like Chio Han, who makes tellies all day, I, I asked him, I said, is there any possible way you could hear the difference between a two-piece body and one-piece body? He's like, no, no. I mean, I think people also, they, uh, they sort of think that those, like, the Gibson factory in the 50s, there was a bunch of drunk rednecks. <laughs> who were making shit in wherever, and there was no like, oh, yeah. science. This will matter 50 years There's from no now. There's no science. <laughs> They're like, I want to get paid. I mean, yeah, it's Friday. I want to get yeah. the fuck out of here. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, that's a, I mean, there are a lot of misconceptions. Yeah, that's what it was like 50s guitars. It's got to be this, it's got to be that. But those were just cats going to a job. Yeah. You know, some of them were talented. Yeah, no, I mean, they, they made really good guitars. They were good at what they did, and, and they well, sounded really good. good materials were, were available. Those cats were a lot of them European were brought over because they had those skills mm -hmm. still. They were around still in the 50s, some of them made it into the 60s, but they made beautiful handmade guitars because that's what was made in the 50s. Yeah. Yeah, in the 60s everything changed. They needed more guitars, bigger factories. They had to start moving faster and then the guitars changed. Yeah. You know, and those guys probably retire. They were probably old guys in the 50s. As in the 60s, they probably started dropping off and the guitars started sucking. You know, or they just need to make more. Yeah. So they could, couldn't use nitro lacquer. And so it's why you, you will get a, like a J45, a 40s J45, and some of them are amazing. One of my favorite guitars. Yeah. Uh, and some of them are just terrible because they're. But they were just putting tops on. They weren't voicing. They weren't doing anything. Right. You know? Yeah. They don't do it like, like yeah. you do. And a, a lot of guys in the classical world, the, the amount of different. Uh, you know, I think the classical builders are the ones that experiment more than anybody else. I mean. Yeah, especially when you, you would go to like I don't go to the shows but I go to the Woodstock guitar show because it's cool. And you see mostly classical builders and yeah. jazz guy builders, and it's an amazing thing. You're like, whoa! Because the tops people are, are really pushing the envelope. Double well. tops. They use tops with Nomex. They use tops with balsa wood. You know, uh, they carve tops from the inside. With right. Yeah, it was all kinds of crazy I've done stuff. Yeah. You know, like like where you don't see that. I don't deal with much handmade boutique acoustic steel string yeah. guitars. Like a mighty niche turned into like electric guitars. That are basically, you know, I do vintage guitars, and most of the boutique guitars I do are somehow based on vintage guitars, right. even if they don't really look like it. They're somehow they are, you know. So there's no one's really pushing the envelope that much, really. But then you do see all these boutique electric guitars where people are going way out there. I love it. I follow some of those guys on that Instagram things, and uh, they're there doing is, amazing things. There is some really, you know, and the reason why Gibson is going out of business because a brand new Les Paul is what thirty five hundred, forty five hundred bucks. A shitty one, right? And one of these guitars is 2800, 3500, same thing. So they made it by hand. And But they're made by hand, they're really cool looking, and they have all these, like, a lot of people are copying the shitty guitars from the 50s. Right. To make, I love those things too. So, yeah. I mean, why buy a factory made guitar when you can buy something yeah, handmade? Yeah, those yeah. things. See, I mean, <laughs> it's all wool full. Yeah, the guitar so, full of out there. Yeah, yeah, so you can, you know, I yeah, actually. Like Cobra's guitars. I think these, there's more handmade electrics, like, better stuff than any factory you can buy right now. No doubt. Yeah. I was trying to tell people that. It's hard to, you almost have to educate people. Like, I, when I was a Chelsea guitar, I went to, I knew they were boutique guitars. I didn't pay attention to them. I was, if it wasn't made in the 50s, I didn't want to know right. about it. You know, like, you but know, I like, didn't feel like there's that many. Even back in the late 90s, I didn't feel like it was like a such a thing. Now it is. Yeah. Because I think the internet really helps that. Yeah. There were guys like, you hear James Taylor had, you know, you know, what would he use, like, you know, one of those small builder acoustic guitars, you know, back then, you know. Right. But most guys are said Martins. Yeah. You know, Crosby, Stills, and Angel, those guys play Martins. You know, they always were doing, or Gibson. Those always That's good. because they gave them to them. No, but they were playing old ones. Right. You know, like Stephen Stills was always into, like, all those guys were into old guitars. They were also cheaper. Yeah, they weren't yeah. expensive. You know, but they were into, you know, you know, T45s, you know, like. Have you, you ever seen a T45 in real life? I don't think I have either. Yeah. I've seen a lot of D42s. Yeah. D45s, I don't think there are many. No, there's like a half a million. They're like $80,000 or something for a shitty one. Right. You know, probably like. Boring. But yeah, a lot of those things. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, we spend a lot of time in. So you see some of these things that are like so sought after. Sometimes they're really amazing, and sometimes uh, they're not. Do you remember the uh, the white penguin? Which one? Lesses? <laughs> there were two. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. You had the second well, one. I tried to sell that a couple times, yeah. I know. Yeah. He probably went out of jail. No, no one bought it. <laughs> but that's why I remember you, because you were working with Les, 
after I, wasn't I had working worked with Les. Him. He was just we were helping him out. He was just a little bit of a scumbag, and he'd be like, "Take this expensive guitar and sell it," because he knew that we didn't know. We were kids, and so then then we're going out trying to pawn a hundred fifty thousand dollar guitar off as real, but we didn't know that. Right. Well, okay. it happens to be. Yeah. Yeah. I worked for him for a long time. Yeah. He also had a couple uh, of the Les Pauls that were really good. Yeah. Yeah. I have some of those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember you were running around with the like. There's Peg Chris, like, yes, doing that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everyone was like, I don't know, because we took it to people who really knew them, you know. And no one wants to spend that much money. And and why would a kid have a white penguin that he's trying to sell anyway? So. Right. Well, there was a lot of because I remember I because I already stopped working for Les. I was working for Danny, and I remember you were helping out Les, which I appreciate because I love Les. You know, like and you were running around with those guitars, but like, you know. You know, that was a strange period, it's like, you know. Well, everyone was starting to catch on. Um, but yeah, they, I mean, the White Penguin's a stupid guitar anyway. It's just a, it's just a... A duo jet with a different neck, with different headstock. Yeah. But it's a million dollar guitar or whatever, yeah. you know. One sold, I think, recently for half a million dollars. But suppose there are only eight of them. Right. Well, nine of them. But let's have two of them. <laughs> yeah, ten. Ten of them. <laughs> ten of them. What are the chances? Yeah. <laughs> and the thing was, is it was a duo jet, and so you figure he would have, like, done the route better under but he did. <laughs> you know, like, you so there? no, but so people who took it apart are like, wait a minute, this is like a duo, and you're like, oh, why didn't he just do that better? Like, they're <laughs> really going to fake it. But, but you know what the thing was though, the pick the the freaking tailpiece was a penguin pe tailpiece right. though, for sure, and that had to be worth what, right, twenty grand for the tailpiece now, right, because they didn't make them, right, except for this. So. Yeah, but I had a fellow who would do that conversion. You can convert them, right? You know, like I have, I did them a couple times with people. The, the, the hard thing was the binding. Right. It was gold sparkly crap. Yeah, it was really from the drums. Right, and it, it was from the fell apart. drums. Right, it fell apart. And you had to get the binding to make the conversion. Right. Was the thing because yeah. you could also convert a constellation to a to a falcon. Right. Or so if you had the binding. Right. Yeah, it was all. But the then you had to make the binding look like it was on there for a long time. Right. Mm -hmm. So like, and guys still do it. Yeah. You know, like, but I remember back then, like, it was all about you could buy a constellation and he could make it into a falcon, hmm. which I always wanted yeah. to do. Right. And then someone gave me a set of the binding. But in the kid. end, the Gretches from the 50s were total pieces of crap. They're funky, yeah. yeah. But the new ones play better and all that, but they don't sound the same. Right. I mean, they're like, they have house wiring in them. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. they're, they're wired with a lamp wire. Totally. Yeah. But like, it's like one of those things. They, they, they have a certain sound. Like, you get, yeah. like, you know, I have an old wrench. You know, like, I want the one. It, you really have to have them just reconstructed. Right. You know, Take it's all like, the shit out and put it. You have them refretted. You have to have the neck reset. You have to do all that stuff. But and if you then, do it, could, then after that, you have like a decent guitar. Right. If you rebuild the entire thing. Pretty smart. Yeah. Right. So like, you know, it, yeah, it's like a, one of those weird things. But they're they do have a sound. You can't get out of anything else. Yeah. Like, you can get new grudges. They don't sound like that. No. They don't sound like an old grudge. You know, but you have to love your grudge because it's gonna fuck around with you the whole time. It, it do new and interesting things every time you do a gig. Right. I remember I had one. I was so into it. I was doing a gig. And just the vibration of playing made the pole pieces start to rise and started grabbing yeah. the strings. Fun. So as I'm playing, it's going... Yeah. And I was like, oh! <laughs> Pull this... And then... It's an option Ooh. now you can get. You know? <laughs> That's like pulling them off the things in the middle of the gig. I'm like, Ugh. like, and then that's a common thing. Like they just start unscrewing themselves and start grabbing your string. Right. So then you have to use thread lock or something. Right. Or some crazy shit. So anyway, mm -hmm. we digress. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's get that. So how long does it take you to build the controller? Oh, uh, depending, you know, on what I'm working on. About two to three months to build a several instruments at once, Wait, so and, that's all, and that's including the finishes, yeah, because the finish takes a long time. So how many guitars do you make a year, roughly? So uh, at this point this year, starting January 1st, I hope to make eight guitars this year. Well, it's not that many. It's not that many, no. It's not. But if they were $50,000, you make them all the same time? Great. Right, you make them all at the same time? No. You make them in batches of yep. batches of two and three. And depending on what I do, if I want to make something that's a little funkier or whatever. Right, or if they're ordered, or they're... Yeah. You're just build. So yeah. you would build eight regardless this year whether they were ordered or not. Whether they ordered or not, yes. Right, because that's so true. And, oh, and the ones, you know, the next guitars are all commissioned, and then the ones after that, I will have uh, a chance to do something different. So, so that the next I can try, so, yeah, so, so that I can try spoke. something, you know, funky or you know, like I want to do. I have a bunch of ideas for you know offset sound holes, uh, mini cutaways, uh, 
you know, a whole bunch of weird stuff I want to try just to... Do you ever want to build an art top guitar or...? It's just... You know, I, I would, uh, yeah, but then I probably would be able to sell that really easy and it seems counterintuitive, so <laughs> why do that? Yeah, easy. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone can do it easy. Yeah, anyone can do it, yeah. Um, I thought about it, but it's a whole new skill set. Right, it's all And I could learn it, it just, I know how to do this right. really well, so I want to keep doing it. This thing is incredible. Yeah, and I think, you know, a nylon string jazz stuff I really like, because right. nobody, not yeah, nobody, but it's very difficult to find a high quality uh, handmade uh, nylon string that has the qualities of a jazz instrument. So, right, with, you know, with like the Chad Atkins as well. Yeah, like, it was the only guitar that even was like that. Cut away a more of a different sound, also just, you know, width, fretboard width, all that kind of stuff. Right. You know. Well, yeah, that makes sense. You know, that if you made this, you know, more like, you, you know, jazz guys would play these. You know? yeah. So, I mean, this is incredible. Even just playing it, just sitting here, like, doing this, this thing is amazing. Yeah, no, they should have a little bit of a, you know, kind of a presence to it. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, because, you know, with guitars, it's you're on the verge of destruction, so the top should be light enough that it sounds good, but too light, it destroys itself too heavy, it sounds right. like crap. Sale. This one? Yeah. <laughs> we'll talk after the thing. <laughs> so your shop is in Sunset Park now? I'm in the uh, Brooklyn Army Terminal. Is that like down on the water over there? Uh, it's down there on the water at 58th to 63rd. It's a huge set of buildings. Right, I've seen that. Yeah. We came in it's that way. It's pretty amazing, actually. It's a cool area. Yeah, it is nice. It's funny that you wound up here, they wound up here, like, the, I guess this is that. Well, area. you know, it's just a, it's just a being forced out of these, for, you know. Well, one of the things for, I have, the biggest problem, I'm sure these guys have this, is finding affordable space to work in New York. Right, well, that's always been the problem. Everybody wants a tech company or some bullshit, you know, to move in and pay too much money for right. three years and stuff. So, but finding, you know, with, when you're building things, you have to be in a space for a long time in order to like, right. you gotta work in it, so. Well, I remember your old space in Red Hook we used to go to, that was a cool space. Oh, it was on the water, I was in an old warehouse, it was, it was great. It was like one of those Civil War buildings, yeah, that was Civil, cool. Yeah. But have the, that building turned into condos or something? No, just, you know, again, I was renting from someone who had the lease, and so uh, they, you know, like everything, everyone gets kicked out for some reason, right. you know. I've been removed from buildings in Red Hook that were not my fault a couple times. Right. So, yeah. yeah, well that happens too, they sell the building. Or, or I just didn't, you know, I was subletting, subleasing, but I had a lease, but I wasn't with the landlord, and then the landlord had a problem, and right. well, I was going to add you go. Yeah. Yeah. Not my fault. <laughs> this thing is incredible. Anything you want to tell people out there about your guitars? Uh, I would say that uh, other than you know, I think uh, other than not necessarily mine, but just people who make guitars by hand, is that you know each one of them has a slightly different sound, which I like. Right. I think finding uh, you know finding uh, a maker who you know who understands or has the same kind of sound profile that you have is really important. Right. So this has got to be a whole different world. Like I deal with electric guitars. It is a whole different world. You know, world. like this is like a serious thing, especially if someone's yeah. going to go perform on this. Yeah. Thing. I mean, the character, since I started building instruments, the character of the sound has changed. Is what right? people want. Yeah. So uh, as people started using alternative tops back in the 80s and 90s, uh, the sound became a little bit more nasally. And what they got out of it was volume. So you know, uh, weird bracing patterns, double tops. You got a lot more volume, but you got a lot more mid-range and not a lot of variables. And so uh, I think a lot of times too, what I find is people want the trebles and mids to be a little bit more, com not compressed, but have a slightly different sound because of that. So, uh, and I think I, maybe it's because uh, of compressed music these days and the way people listen right. to stuff. So what, when they, what they hear, so, I like a guitar that has like, you know, tr flute trebles, really crystal clear, like traditional bracing. It's, you know, it's like very sweet. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people, if I let them play one of my newer instruments, and newer instruments have a lot more cross bracing uh, uh, against the top, right. which closes down the top, and if you make it really light, gives it a little bit more kick. They bark a little right. bit more. So the trebles are a, a lot more barky and have a lot more, they're more mids, and they, they lose just a hair of that sweetness, but people like that sound which is weird. So it's just a matter, so you have to build to what people. And you can tell exactly what that will do before you build a guitar? 
Oh, you ever yeah. build it and it doesn't have that sound well? Well, no, I know what bracing. I, you know, with classicals, bracing is everything. So, oh, is that right? Well, bracing and a lot of other things. You know, you got to. They have to be made really well. They have to have no tension. So, the sides can't be forced. Nothing can be forced. It has to fit perfectly with just a little bit of glue, right. so that all the energy goes into moving the top, and that's it. So, well, that's you cool. know, like a lot of the old. Uh, a style mandolins and, and 20s Gibsons, all the butt joints come apart. Right. That's because they're forced together, and over time they'll come back apart. Uh, so the, everything has to be, has to like the sides. So where Lloyd Lore came in and fixed all that shit? I don't know that. But I just know that they, that disease where they all pop. Right. Because they're forced. But so my sides when I put them together, <laughs> squeeze. I just they're, they're just perfect. They're perfectly they just go inside, together. and that right, you don't into, push them together. It translates into sound. So, that makes sense. Yeah, because especially with these, because all every bit of energy matters, and so you want it all to be caught up in the sound of the top vibrating, much like a speaker, and not caught up in like you know cross waves of finding something that they don't you know. I assume like, it's the same thing with a steel string guitar. Yeah, I think yeah, yeah. The you know the more precise, the more you don't hear as much of this stuff though. You know, like I guess it is. You can. I mean, I think it's just depending. I mean, still strings are a different kind of animal. Yeah, I don't right. know. If maybe the people are as tuned in as what you're describing. Right. Like we, you know, like because I assume people come to your place, they could hear everything that you just described. Yeah, or they're, they're asked for that. You know, and the tops are radius on these. My new ones have a radius of the whole top, whereas I think a lot of flat tops are not quite as radius. Right. Hence flat top, but it makes a big difference. You know, you're just trying to make a speaker come. Right. That's all. Yeah, see, because I mean, you when you play this thing, like, I've never played classical like does this. Yeah, because you play Yamaha, it's like yeah, no, but like, it has, like, a, has a resonance and it kind of it kind of goes on for a while. Yeah, but the energy just it doesn't get caught up in other things, and it'll just you know. But old Martins, they said, were like this, like called portable pianos, you know, right. like, where I have one, and you, and you would do this, and it would just still be going like this. Well, yeah, and that, a lot of times, because the tops are super thick on those, by the time now, that's why they're sounding good. Is that right? I bet that Martin they didn't sound that good back sounded then. like a horse, just Is that right? Black. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny, because we, we would have just thought they sounded great back then, and they sound even better now. No, I think they sounded terrible, because they were too thick. You know, right? Yeah, I think they were way too thick. Like a 40s D28 or something like that? Yeah, I mean, they probably sounded decent, but I don't, you know... I have a feeling that, you know, if the, t if the top's of a certain thickness, it takes a while to get that to open. So, you know, like there's that, the, a thin top immediately sounds good. Uh, the maturity curve is much shorter and right. it'll die. A thicker top, it takes a long time to get up to reach its maturity and then it dies that way. So, I bet you a 40, the one, if your 40s Martin probably didn't sound anything like what it does now. Interesting. I'm guessing. Right. You know, like when I string these time. up, like brand new guitars sound like dogs. They're terrible. This, when you string up a nylon string, it just sounds like horse crap. And how long does it take till it starts to sound? Uh, you know, it takes a while. They, and you, how do you make it happen? Well, you I, play it? Or you, you play it, I keep them hanging. I started using those vibrators, string vibrators. Right, that's a real thing. Um, yeah. Then, like, old jazz guys would, like, Put them in front of the speaker. That's and like put them in front of the speaker and they leave the house yeah. and play record. And, and that's the problem with these. You know, you, you show a brand new guitar and you're like, eh. You know, but two years later, it sounds amazing. Right. The, That's why we never like new guitars. Yeah. You know, like, I still don't like new guitars. Like, the boutique guitars tend to sound good, but they probably were doing something similar. Yeah. You know, like, but, like, you know, like, we always hate new guitars. You know, like, it's like, oh, this sounds like shit. I hate new guitars. Yeah, I do, too. <laughs> but now you don't, because with the boutique guitar movement, all this, you know, these guys right. ship your guitar, and it sounds amazing well, the second you play And that's it. why they build all these fancy, super thin tops out of space age materials to simulate the aging process. Oh, interesting. Yeah. But isn't the thinner the top, the more you could get top cracks? Yeah, everything. It'll die faster, it'll whatever. You know, like a lot of, uh, there are some makers in New York, the Mill Thomas Humphrey made a Millennium guitar, which is kind of beautiful design, actually. It's kind of cool. Uh, and it's a lattice brace top. And I've heard some of them years later, and they sort of diminish quickly, you know, a little faster in sound. They don't have as much power because they're real f thin and right off the bat. Interesting. Yeah. So, like, say, guilds from the 70s are known to have thick tops. They don't mm -hmm. top crack very often. They sound good. But yeah. you pick them up something that they're heavy. Yeah. But they sound good. Right. So. Well, I mean, sometimes you can make a guitar that has a thick top, you know, as long as it's balanced in a certain way, it will still sound good. But there is a limit, you know. There's right. a limit to. To what you can. Yeah, you can make a thick it. top with light bracing or a thin top with thick bracing. Or but even those guitars are more likely to last longer. Yes, last longer, sound better longer. Right, see, I love old guilds yeah. from the 70s, 60s. I always think they're the things to buy. Yeah. Sometimes old Martins don't sound Do that you ever great. use the uh, that vibrating the vibrator thing? No. Uh, I use it. it. It works 
on on these, it's it 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 takes about a week. And just I'm just moving them a lot, you know. And so it's a variable vice to vibrator you set on the strings. It fits in between. Oh, it sits on the strings. It sits in between. You can shove it in there, and you make them for different string widths. But it's just a little box. It looks like a pickup. Uh, it works a little bit better on the arch top and the mandolins and that kind of family because it really starts to open them up. It energizes them a lot. Wow. So, and what's fun is if you take one for, you should do it two or three days, uh, A, B them like an old Martin. Right. It does make a huge difference. It will yeah. really open it up. It really just gets it moving and just gets it, you know. So people should be doing that to their old guitar. Uh, I mean, yeah, I think it sounds good just to, if, it's, if they don't play it a lot. I mean, the thing right. about it is playing is the thing that makes them sound good. Right. So if you play the guitar a lot, it sounds good. Well, we'd always notice that at Chelsea. Like, you know, if, if it's a you're playing guitar, that guitar all the time, it starts sounding really good. Yeah, I can hear these with people playing a new guitar of mine. For a half hour, it, the sound quality improves in, the, in a half hour. You can right. hear it physically improve a little bit. Yeah. Well, I used to feel that at Chelsea. Like, you know, we would take a gold guitar and start playing, and you'd start to feel it. Yeah. You'd start to feel like, yeah. this sounds better than it did yesterday. Yeah, it just needs I to... I even tell my own guitars. Like, I'll pull out a guitar and play a long time, and it sounds up tight. That's the way I always describe it. You like, just have to, you know, they have to come to that spot where the energy has nowhere else. You know, it's not being sucked up by something else. Right. It's not being... You know, redirected or. Because if you didn't play this guitar for five years, if you just put it away, it wouldn't sound as good as it sounds now, right? It would. It would. Yeah. It, it would probably stiff it up slightly. Just a, probably just a hair. Wouldn't take much to get it back. To right. Then you start playing it. It does yeah. it again. Yeah. But this, they don't die. Like it, if no, you, don't, if they you don't play die. this guitar for a hundred years, it wouldn't. No, they don't die. die. I mean, I think the more you, the the whole thing about the maturity curve in guitars, I think, is the use. So right. you have to, you know. That's if you're using it a lot. But that was always the, the big thing to you, because we could always get those really beat up guitars. And we'd be like, is this guitar so good sounding that someone played it and it got beat up? Or does it sound good because it got beat up? Yes, because someone played it so much. It played like, it so much. And so then it, you know, it found the place where the energy had the least amount of resistance. And so then when you hit a string, it transfers all that energy straight to producing sound rather than getting caught up in something else. Interesting. That's my thoroughly, like, Super scientific went to school right. analysis. Of that. Right, because you know when you work Total, in guitar shops, you get all these yeah. misconceptions, and it's all secondhand folklore. Yeah. Like, and now with exactly forums, like, it's even worse. Really gonna, yeah. Right, you know, with forums, you have people go like, "Oh, you know, PAFs were from space or whatever." You yeah. know, it's like, oh, true story. Days, yeah. like, I made it. You know, but you know, like the PAF is like, you know, it's like the. Yeah. thing. <laughs> and every single podcast, PAFs come up, so I just made it happen again. Um, yeah, no. A classical guitar podcast. Do, do, PAFs. I, do <laughs> I think they sound good? I mean, you could A-B them. Thing is, I have had a, I've had some expensive, I had a guitar in my shop that was, I won't tell you the maker, it was old, but it was a couple hundred thousand bucks. There's not that many guitars that go through classical guitars in that range. Right. I had a professor in, and I gave, I said, play this, but I don't look at it, just play it and tell me the thing. And, and he's, he's a classical guitar professor, played it. He's like, meh, you know, it's okay. It's right. kind of bleh. And then he saw what it was, and he starts playing it again. He goes, oh, yeah. I, and I'm like, BS. Because that's what happens. That's oh, no, you, you, you are. definitely hear with your eyes. They're BS. <laughs> no, PAFs, I think, really are. I mean, some of them might sound Some of them good, sound really good, but right. But a lot of people who make uh, But could you tell without right. looking at no. it? No. Right. Because we started doing that at the last guitar show. We started doing blind tests. Right. You know, like, I was wondering, if you put four 50 strats and one Mexican <clears throat> strat there, yeah. and someone turns their back, could they pick the Mexican strat out of those guitars? You mean by hearing it? Right. Yeah. Well, without seeing it. Without seeing it, yeah. Probably not. Probably not. Especially if you relic a little bit? No way. Or you know, like, even if they the didn't see guitars, we could say there's four 50 strats here and right. one's a Mexican that was made last week. Right. We're going to play them all. Tell me which one's the Mexican. Right. Because those 450 strats are going to sound so different to each other. Yeah, yeah. They don't all sound the same because they're from the 50s. It just doesn't work that way. And they don't all sound amazing. Yeah. And that Mexican strat can sound amazing. Yeah. So when you take your eyes out of the equation or you know what it is, when you go, hey, this guitar is from the 50s and it has PAFs, so everyone's going to think it sounds amazing. Well, that's the thing about buying, I think, buying guitars is you have to have someone who can say, this guitar does actually sound you know, this guitar's worth it. Right. Because it sounds great. Sounds it might look crappy, but it sounds great. Right, like Nightbot is like that. Like, you know, you'll go, like, like yeah. How did he get the name Nightbot? <laughs> he worked at a rehearsal studio and there was two Bobs and one worked during the day. 
at one more dead night. Cool. <laughs> so Mike somewhere Bob. there was a day Bob. Was it day Bob? Yeah, I said, do you still know him? And he was like, no. Yeah. <laughs> but he always figured it was like something really he interesting. Early. He was like, I Die. worked at a rehearsal studio. <laughs> I worked at night. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, but he's got that those ears. You know, right. obviously he's a sound engineer. You know, but, you know, like, he has a million stories of being with, like, you know, big rock star guys and they're buying these guitars. And he's like, the guitar sounds terrible. Yeah. But they bought it anyway because they thought it sounded cool. Right. You know, or they sort of look cool. You know, like, but. And rock and musicians like, are super smart. <laughs> but but it's because it's a hundred thousand dollar guitar, it's got to be good. Yeah. You know, and they aren't all. No. You know, but you assume, oh, it's a hundred thousand dollars, it's got to be good. You know, or it's a burst, a uh, burst, burst, burst. You know, everyone talks about bursts, and I'm sure, it's, I'm sure there's things in your world that are that. Yeah, they're investment the, vehicles for rich people. They're places for people to park their money and then get it out again. Well, yeah, but sometimes they're real good. Yeah. Sometimes. You know, like, you know yeah. and sometimes they're not so. So then good. they serve two purposes. Right, yeah. and then there's. A million fakes of them, and yeah. you know, people buy those and think they're real and all that kind of shit. You know, like, do people do that with classicals? Are there fake? the fakes? You know, there are of like uh, Ramirez's. Or? It was funny because I went to the Yale Instrument Museum with a group of woodworkers. Totally super cool event, and uh, we were looking at furniture. But we went to the other, and they brought out some of their older instruments, and they had a Torres, which is the thing. Right. And uh, that's the one guitar people do fake, and. I was really the only instrument maker, so she let me handle it, and I'm like, wait a minute. You you know? Know, it's like a $150,000 instrument. And then I look inside it, and it has a little Made in Mexico sticker, or Made in Spain sticker, because I think we used to do that when we exported them. And I started looking at it, and I'm like, oh my god. And so I said, do you have two of these? Because this <laughs> one is not real. I hope I didn't, you know, I was like... Unless your world over it. Yeah, because yeah, this is a $150,000 guitar that you just got totally ripped off on. But that's the one guitar that they do fake. Interesting. But you can't fake these really well because of the sound quality, you know, like... It just wouldn't sound that well. Well, you'd have to mimic the sound, you'd have to mimic... Years yeah, you'd have age. to mimic the exact sound of the instrument that they're known for and all that, and the and the wood is tough to do. Right. And and because classicals are worth, ultimately, so little, why go to all that trouble to spend six months making something you're going to suffer $22,000? Right, that was the thing with the electric guitars. Like, you don't see fake Martins. No, because it's in... Well, I mean, yeah, you, it's why. I mean, it's... I mean, even make a fake D forty five, like you know, like that's guitars worth a lot of money. Yeah, but you don't see fake ones, or do no. you? I've never I, heard of that. I don't. It'd probably be too hard. I think the, any the one anyone who has the skills to fake something that well should be making Could make guitars a guitar, right. and sell it for more money. Right, just make like, a less Paul. You can make fake less, fake less Paul. I'm sure they can make one back there. Yeah. You know, like you know, we know how to make a Les Paul. You can not that they're internet. making fake. Not that they're doing it, but <laughs> you know. yeah. but you know, it's so it's so not hard compared to this. Yeah, it's yeah. not like someone could hear because we know people can't hear the difference. Yeah, they do it. The violin world is notorious for that. Oh yeah, uh, it's like uses. yeah, everyone in their Stradivarius. Right. So and, yeah, that and is. that is always the heartbreaking story of in the guitar store working is old people who come in and you're like, sorry, you know. Oh, you know how many times I had to tell the person yeah. what they had wasn't the thing. You yeah. know, like that happened a lot. Like you know, like in the '90s when I was working in guitar shops and like. People had bought the guitars in the 70s yeah. and had them under the bed. They had the late plastic blue strat. Now the right. kids going to college and the late plastic blue strats were 25 grand and yeah. they can use the 25 grand now. So they bring it into the shop and you go, cool. You know, I've been talking about this guitar for years. You know, yeah. they had it and they bring it in. They'd be like, oh, I want to sell it. I'd be like, all right, cool. You know, bring it in. And either it was a refin or the body wasn't even fender. Right. Yeah. The pickups were not real, but they bought it like in the 70s. No one took things apart and looked. Right. No. Yeah. You know, and it was. The twenty-five thousand dollars they thought they had under the bed. Yes. Yeah, sometimes it was worth nothing. Sometimes yeah. it was just a neck. Sometimes it was like ripe. It's a refin. Right. You know, but no one thought about it, and that there was a rash of that for a while because it became that time when those cats needed that money. Sure. You know, they were either going to retire or they had this twenty thousand dollars guitar. They don't play guitar anymore. You know, so, and, and but they were the time everything they brought in was bad. Spending asinine amounts on things. Right? Yeah, because they were buying stuff in the seventies and eighties from you know no one took stuff apart. Yeah. You know, like, so, like, you would just trust that they got I did it with record you. collections. I buy records. And That's I right. Used, I used to buy a lot of records. records. I've already, and the same thing. They were like, yeah, I have all these jazz records, or I have this and that. And never, once, ever did I go to this and person's was, house and was it good shit. Right. Ever. Yeah. The only I time remember I, you were doing that even back then. Ever. It was always wrong. There was, you know, always, they didn't know what they were talking about. The right. only time you get good records and someone dies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that whole thing's come back now. You know, like, yes. Because I listened came to back, like, away, you know, came back, yeah. But you were doing that way back when. I was, yeah, I stopped doing it a little bit. It became, it became well, you were a $500 jazz record. It became obsessive compulsive, and then you 
got to stop. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm into it, but like I just and, like records. Do you know how many people? Who cares that you have like an eighteen hundred dollar, you know, rare Coltrane record? Right. Nobody. <laughs> what you bring over? You're like girl, and you're like, hey, look at that. That's a record. You know, like, oh, yeah. look, a record. Yeah. No one cares. Well, how does that work? Yeah. You yeah, know, somebody whose like niece came over and didn't understand what those things were. Oh yeah, that happens. What the hell's that? How does oh. that make music? Little kids are confused by CDs. So. Yeah. <laughs> His CDs just died. I don't know. Yeah. They're stupid. I have a million of them. <laughs> I'm gonna play it. I just went Spotify. Yeah. No, I, <laughs> I don't know. But now I want to listen to records again. It's cool. So, so we've been at it for a while. So taking a break. No, we're going to talk about something else. <laughs> well, we have to talk about those because okay. they're sitting right there. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about those. Let's okay. put this down. Great. So these are your ruby knives. Yes. And they are. How did you start making knives? Well, I mean, I made knives because I, was, you know, I do guitar repair occasionally, and I just, um, I was just so sick of doing guitar repair in some sense. I mean, I mostly do classical repair now. But I don't right. Do anything well, I remember even when I was bringing your repairs, you didn't really want to do them. You would just um, do them. And I just, you know, I made, I, I've made some of my old hand planes, some of my own uh, woodworking knives, you know, like violin knives, carving knives, and so. Uh, and you know, I'm just—it's such a guy thing. I think fascinated by pointy, sharp things. Yeah, and, that you uh, could kill people. And the knife is just such—you know—like man's oldest tool. And so every time you pick it out, you're like, makes you feel good. With like this genetic memory, you're like, stabby. Yeah. Um, and I just started making kitchen knives because uh, you know they're useful. So, and I wanted, and I have a lot of friends who are professional chefs. I love to cook. I had a cooking show. Right, you just mentioned that. Yeah, um, really good. And. Uh, Won an Emmy for it. You won an Emmy? No. And uh, <laughs> uh, I did not. Um, oh, it was great. a show about drinking and cooking, mostly drinking. Where did we find that? I can't remember the name of it. But I do. Um, oh. So the knives I make because I like. I like. Uh, these are very difficult because they're so simple in some sense. Uh, you know, like a kitchen knife. You're just like, oh, it's just a sharp metal. Thing. There, but there's a lot more to it. Was layers of metal. Like, and like guitar world, you can get absolutely insanely nerdy about everything involved with this mm -hmm. and go, you know, down the rabbit hole of all that stuff. But uh, you know, I like these because people actually use them. They use them to make food with. Uh, you know, it's one of those things that you use every day, but you don't think about it kind right. of thing. And so that's why I like them. No, it's very cool because I got one from you not long ago, maybe a month ago, and it changed my world. No, it's just because I cook. I love cooking, but like, wow. Well, I had it's, a knife. Just, it's nice to have something that's sharp and something that works well. And it really works. You know, well. and I. But find it takes a second to get used to a real knife. Not that it never real knife. Right, no, yeah. Like that. At first, I was like, it "Doesn't cut that good." Right. Or it depends how you use yeah, it. Yeah, learn to cut with it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, you're sitting here cutting paper with it. No. Yeah. These will <laughs> these will shave right now. Um, yeah. But, All right. Uh, this is gonna be worth it. <laughs> Whoa. That is. Are you fucking seeing that? Medical. It is sharp. That shit is sharp. And that's a big knife, too. But, uh, Do it again. <laughs> I took one of his catalogs and I cut it up. <laughs> we didn't need this. <laughs> yeah. So you can, you can actually shave with this. Wow. That's fucking sick. <laughs> um, that's like crazy. But no, you know, the kitchen, like, chess is a good example of a lot of... It's, it has only so many rules. You can only do so many things with it, but yet you will have these players who have this entire, you know, personality and style doing it. Right. Knives like these are. I mean, I mean they're all different shapes, but there's only so many things, you know. And right. then you got to express yourself within a very confined right. sort of, which I like because that way it's little subtle things that make differences. But anyway, that's why I like making knives. It's a side thing. Um, but you can find that you have an Instagram for your knives. Yeah, I have Instagram for the knives and the. Uh, yeah, and the guitars. I mean, I still mostly do guitars and knives, especially now because it's Christmas, so I'm right. that kind of thing. And these are all different, I assume. Yep, I make, uh, you know, uh, so basically the two kind of styles are a Western style of knife, which is like your French, you know, the classic French right. knife. I think that's what I have. Which, yeah, metal goes all the way through the handle. And then uh, Japanese styles of knife, which have, you know, thousands of different kinds of knife styles. Right. They have a knife for every kind of fish and all right. sorts of very obsessive compulsive I don't do that but um, you know they're for slightly different uh, styles of cooking so Japanese I think are more slicers with things and they're more a little forward whereas the uh, European stuff can be a lot of rocking back and forth chopping this way you know that kind of thing and it's just a matter of what people are comfortable holding right and using 
Because like the one that Craig got looks more like a... That is like a, a Japanese vegetable knife called right. Kiri. Yeah. That's really cool. And it's, you know, it's an unusual shape if you're not used to it, but it's, you know, in a lot of Chinese kitchens, they're cooking with things that are twice that high. They're super right. thin, big cleavers, and they're cutting everything with a cleaver. But it's not a cleaver, it's, it's just the knife. It's it the looks thing, right. like our cleaver. Right, his looks like a cleaver. Yeah. Right. That's very cool. All right, well, so we are sort of getting to the end. So, this was my wife's idea, of course. So Do I have to answer give... some kind of like trivia question? <laughs> sort of. Okay. No, you have to answer five questions. It's the only thing that's kind of uniform on our podcast. Okay. Is at the end we ask five questions, which I forgot to bring them with me, but I think I remember most okay. of them. And they're basic questions, and most of the time you cover them during this, but sometimes you don't. Okay. And sometimes sure. we uncover interesting things. Um, First of all, what is something a lot of people don't know about Matt Rubidoux? I'm optimistic. <laughs> You're supposed to tell the truth. I am. <laughs> I'm very optimistic. <laughs> okay. Things are going to turn out pretty good. Okay. okay. See, we didn't know that. Yeah. We thought you were very pessimistic. Yeah, everyone so. thinks that, but that's not true. <laughs> and you love people. I love people, yes. That's, that's actually not true. Actually. I know. <laughs> I worked at a retail store with you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was pretty good. What are you listening to these days? Uh, right now, I listen. Well, I listen to stuff all the time. I think it's important to have giant ears. You know what I mean by that? I list, Right now, I'm listening to a lot of uh, jazz coming out of London. The jazz scene right there is amazing. Currently? Yep, it's amazing. There's a lot of like. There's a big th spiritual jazz throwback kind of scene, like Alex Coltrane stuff. I love that stuff. Uh, it is one of my favorites, you know, Pharaoh Sanders. And right, I love all that stuff. Uh, but yeah, you know, um, I, I didn't even know I what listen. people are currently doing now. Oh, like, who are some of the artists? Uh, let's see, the Ezra, uh, uh, oh god, these guys are called, um, this is all, I listen to this every day, but I can't remember, Ezra song. I could come up with them a little right. bit. But, I'll tell you what I listen to. But it to sounds like those Alice Coltrane records. Oh yeah, a lot of them. I, I mean, love that stuff. There is, and there's, and you know, and I think it's in, it's in, uh, where the Liverpool or one of those smaller. See, I would have never. Known other than that, that, there's a whole like spiritual jazz. Is it popular? Do they sell yeah. a lot of records? Yeah, I mean, jazz guys never sell a lot of records. Right, but but like, there's who's a, listening to that. Young people or just yeah, old? young people. Is that right? There's a lot of cool. I mean, it's a really some of it. You know, nothing is nothing is like you know, sunship like that the Coltrane album where he's just freaking out. Nothing right. today is that Right, no one would be able to deal with that, right? I mean, well also just the complexities. There are people who play that well, but that's rare. Right, it's like being Hendrix again. You but know, so. yeah, there is a lot of there is just a lot of amazing that kind of sound is Is it called is that movement called something? Like um, I, would I don't find know. that stuff. You I know, like, you know where I listen to it on and I'm and I'm not trying to do a shameless plug, but I listen to it all on Spotify or on um, Bandcamp. I've never done Bandcamp. Bandcamp is amazing, uh, only for, and I am not being paid by Bandcamp, because <laughs> there is a lot of stuff uh, that is self-produced and smaller produced stuff. So most of the, like Blue Note does not do jazz. I mean, they do new jazz, but it's it's light crap. Right. Um, all the stuff that's coming out that is like anywhere, you know, it, any more heady or any more melodic is coming through there. Uh, You'll find like a lot of weird metal bands. I like uh, a lot of electronic stuff. Uh, it's a, it's pretty amazing for new new music. That's you know, cool stuff. I I love it. Yeah. Very That's very very cool. Um, okay, so those were two of them. Um, here's an interesting one. If you were not doing this, what would you do? You mean do do I have to be working or can I be a speed? Lounging you could just be to drunk someplace if you wanted to be. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you don't have to have an answer for them. I would you be know? a machinist. So, that makes sense. I love machinists. A lot of people were chefs. You know, a lot of people have said, what do I do? Like, oh, I'd probably be cooking I'd work a in the kitchen for... Right now. No. <laughs> but a lot of people, that seems to be a common thing. They're like, oh, if I wasn't building guitars, I'd probably be a chef. I, would be, I want to be a machinist. <laughs> okay, next question. <laughs> okay. Um... What is on the horizon for Matt Rubidoux? Uh, the horizon? Like, well, going forward. I just my lease. I have 14 years left on my lease here in New York, which is amazing. So that's one lease. It is, is it for a 20-year lease. Uh, 15. So I am. Uh, my my plans are to a. I mean, keep doing what I'm doing now. So guitar-wise, every guitar I make is a little bit different. Um, 
part of me, because the classical scene is such a clicky scene, and if you're not the guy who's like, oh, that's the guitar everyone should have, you know, I'm sure it's the same way in a lot of things. People right. are. Kind what of happens in the boutique guitar? World, it's dis electric. They're dismissive. Like, even if oh, the everybody wants that one guitar. It's just a guitar. It's yeah. always just been a guitar. And so at this point, you know, I'm not that guy in that scene, which is great. Right. And I kind of want to just start making weirder and more experimental instruments. Things that I like, things that I think look good, sound good, you know. Same this and the knives, too. I just want to keep, you know, pushing the envelope of what I do. So, you know, trying to make the best thing I can make. Because in the end, I don't, I could care less, this is not going to say, about the people who play them. That's not true. Uh, but in <laughs> essence, I'm just competing with myself. Right. That's, well, that's what you're supposed to be doing. I just want to make something great. Or you're supposed to make a better guitar each time. Yeah, I mean, it's just, a, it's just a game that I'm playing with myself to see, and that's really what is important at this point. That's what you're saying. And also to be, able, to be able to keep doing it. That's all I want to do. That's it. I think that is it. I have four questions. I know. Well, the other one you kind of answered. You know, like, uh, what were you doing before this? Uh, I was cleaning my shop. No, not direct. Oh. What were you doing before the whole guitar thing? Uh, <laughs> what were you doing right before you came here? I was cleaning the shop. <laughs> Just out of curiosity. Absolutely filthy. Yeah. What are you doing right after this? Uh, eating bagel, drinking coffee, cleaning the shop. Yeah. No, like, what, did you have weird jobs before you got into the guitar thing? Oh, I did work in some restaurants, you know. A lot of people that. did that, right? Because uh, it was very easily accessible. I like the mental part of it, you know. Right. Being in the weeds when you're so backed up is really thrilling. It's a absolute panic without having to jump off something. You right. Know, like being panicked. Uh, yeah, no, I had no really weird jobs. Yeah, like you know, like Josh from Protocaster made curtains. You can no. find some interesting that question sometimes yields some really interesting things. I cooked like, a night shift at a 24 hour diner in Lafayette, Indiana <laughs> on a college campus. That was, that was fun. Football so players, I watched people pass out biscuits and gravy. I started food fights in which the whole restaurant started throwing food at each other. I got everyone to do the wave. It was awesome. <laughs> that sounds fun. Yeah, they were just drunk. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Indiana seems to be like the highest. Alcoholism, right? I would say it's Wisconsin. Wisconsin has <laughs> no, they do. Wisconsin has the best bars in the Midwest. Is that right? They have. You can find these great local bars that are not full of dirt bags, but like all your friends go, uh, really warm, inviting, lots of food. People hang out. I think the Wisconsin drinking culture is great. All right. Well, we gotta go to Wisconsin. It's cool. it seems <laughs> road trip. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Right after this, yeah. we're going to Wisconsin. <laughs> Um, awesome. Well, Matt, it has been an absolute pleasure. It was really fun, actually. Do you have a website? Yes. You must. Uh, I think it's mattrubendahl.com and rubyknives.com. Oh, oh, they actually, I didn't know they had their own website. Oh, they have their own website. And you're on Instagram, obviously. Yep. You don't do much Facebook. You're mostly Instagram. I mean, I have Facebook when I post on Instagram, but yeah, right. I, Facebook confuses me. <laughs> but it has been an absolute pleasure. It's been and fun. Thank you for being on the podcast. Thank you.